Broadcasting live on the UnitedWest.org and AM Radio Network and simulcasting on DirecTV, iHeartRadio, Roku, and the World Wide Web, this is Enemies of the State with Tom Trento. Yesterday, Glenn Beck had this to say about Karl Rove. So here's my message to Carl Rove. If you want to rumble, buddy, come on on. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Let's, I'll do an hour with you. I'll do two hours. I'll do six hours with you, Carl. Come on the radio. Come on television because with your record and the record of the GOP, I would love to talk to you about your strategy. As I said um, over the weekend and has been reported everywhere, and I, I think it I think it's worth saying again, you guys have the spine of a worm, the ethics of whores, and the integrity of pirates, with my apologies to worms, whores, and pirates. <laughs> and a week ago, Glenn Beck and Frank Caffney had a discussion about Grover Norquist and him running for a board membership on the National Rifle Association. Listen to this conversation. And what's so worrying to me about the possibility that he might be reelected to the board, it's bad enough that he was on it in the first place, but reelected to the board of the National Rifle Association, is that I think uh, these influence operations on behalf of enemies of this country are continuing. We've done a dossier on this, which people can check out at securefreedom.org. It's called Agent of Influence, Grover Norquist and the Assault on the Right. Wow. I will tell you that I am so concerned about this, Frank, and I, I am not uh, an expert on Grover Norquist by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I have heard enough that makes me concerned enough that, and, and, and I hope the leadership of the NRA hears this, and every member of the NRA hears this, that if this man is elected uh, or re-elected and confirmed on the board of the NRA, I may drop my membership in the M NRA. I mean, I just, I am that concerned that he is a very bad influence and a very bad man. That if this is who the NRA decides to put uh, on their board of directors, uh, I, I don't think I can be associated with them. So why does Glenn Beck seem to have such disdain for both Carl Rove and Grover Norquist? Hi, my name is J. Mark Campbell. I'm filling in for Tom Trento this week, as he's off in Israel. And Tom and I did an expose about a year ago, which I think is very pertinent this time, exposing Grover Norquist nefarious operations inside the Republican Party as a top paid lobbyist in Washington, D.C. who had the direct ear of the President of the United States. So how does Karl Rove come to play in all this? What's, why is Glenn Beck mad at him? Well, you see, Karl Rove is the one who brought Grover Norquist into the highest levels of the Republican Party, all the way up to the President of the United States. In fact, Karl Rove is a lifelong friend of Grover Norquist. In fact, Grover, Norqu Grover Norquist was mentored by none other than Karl Rove. Anyway, sit back and enjoy this micro-series that Tom and I did about a year ago, and at the end we'll come back and close it up and give you some final thoughts. Hi, I'm Tom Trento, Director of the United West, and I am here at the epicenter of political power in Washington, D.C. In fact, folks, just four blocks west of here is where the President of the United States resides. And just down the street from him is the United States Capitol, where Congress resides. And just a few blocks north of them is where all the K Street lobbyists are located. And right here, is where the most powerful unelected man in Washington, D.C. resides. A man who most people never heard of, most Americans never heard of him before. This man is a lobbyist, a rootin' tootin', gun for hire, money loving lobbyist. And for many, many dollars, he will convince congressmen and senators and presidents to do whatever the hell you want those guys to do. Our rootin' tootin' lobbyists will keep sweatshops open in the Marianas for Chinese businessmen, for major U.S. corporations. He'll pass legislation in order to swindle Indian casinos all over the United States, 
This man will do anything for the highest bidder. This lobbyist who ramrods legislation right through with Democrats and Republicans to pass amnesty type bills for illegal aliens, he will direct millions of dollars to both sides of the aisle just to get people elected who will listen to him. This man who tells the GOP how high to jump and who should be the next president, this lobbyist has so much power that when his college buddy and business partner went down, went down folks for bribing congressmen and buying influence. Our lobbyist avoided federal prosecution. He even avoided suspicion. All the while while making Faustian deals with Muslim terrorists. This guy knows no limits because he knows where all the bodies are buried. You see, in a very real sense, our gunslinging lobbyist is the wizard of K Street. He is the most powerful, unelected man in Washington, D.C. This lobbyist is a man accountable to absolutely no one. This man is Grover Norquest. And he lives right here, behind this curtain. Bad guys, government lies, and Muslim spies. That's the name of our investigative micro-series where we produce each week a short video. Our show series is entitled the Wizard of K Street. And the episode today is entitled K Street Capitalism, Chicom Style. Hi, I'm Tom Trento with the United West team. And last week in episode one, uh, we introduced the Wizard of K Street himself, Grover Norquest, boy nerd turned wunderboy Washington lobbyist. Our metaphorical use of the Wizard of Oz folks is on point because just like that wizard, just like him, Grover hides behind a curtain, manipulates Washington politicians, accumulates personal wealth, fame, and power, all in order to transform America into a borderless country that's part of a larger global community. Our thesis for this investigative series is that Grover is not the super conservative that he presents himself to be, but indeed Grover Norquist is an ideological enemy of the state. As you will see through our exposition of the evidence, America is worse off because of Grover's 30-year influence. And you have been impacted personally by Grover's political ambition and political activism. To understand exactly how Grover has reached out and touched you, let's take a trip down memory lane. Ah, the 90s, the 1990s, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, a Pacific Ocean tropical paradise. In fact, Guinness states that the islands have the world's record for the most consistent temperature, 80.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That is a perfect place to walk the beaches, to scuba dive, to play tennis, to play golf, and an absolutely perfect place to run a Chinese sweatshop for the U.S. garment industry that makes millions and millions of dollars. You see, the Marianas are a U.S. commonwealth. And back in the 90s, they were loosely bound by U.S. immigration laws, which were designed to protect the U.S. workers from a flood of cheap foreign labor, which would drive down wages and drive down available jobs. Second, Marianas were also loosely bound by U.S. labor laws. These laws were designed to protect workers from unscrupulous businessmen and politicians. And third, this is really crazy, if you have a product made in the Commonwealth, you can have it say, made in the USA. This means if you're a company who has a desire to have your clothing made in America, but you're not really in America, and you're a politician or a businessman in a Commonwealth, and you wanna bypass US immigration law to provide cheap labor for the company who wants their label to read made in the USA, then all you, all you need, folks, is a K Street lobbyist and a bag full of money to make sure that US immigration and US labor laws are not followed, or at least they're circumnavigated. So who do you hire? How do you get that done? Well, it's simple. You hire the root and toot and gunslinging lobbying team of Jack Abramhoff and Grover Norquist. And that's exactly what happened back in the 90s. Jack and Grover lobbied aggressively in the US Congress to allow unlimited guest workers 
into the Marianas, in effect, bypassing U.S. immigration laws. As a result, a United States Senate investigation revealed that 91% of the workforce in the Marianas became Chinese and Filipino guest workers. Further U.S. Senate testimony revealed that these workers were enslaved, enslaved by their employers and forced to live behind barbed wire and squalid shacks without plumbing. But it gets worse. A Department of the Interior report found that I quote, Chinese women were subject to forced abortions along with women and children subject to forced prostitution in the local sex tourism industry. But of course, folks, Jack Abramhoff was not aware of all of this when he arranged for an all expense paid trip to the Marianas for Texas legislator Tom DeLay on New Year's Eve, 1997. And Jack had no idea what was going on when he helped Representative Ralph Hall craft statements attacking the credibility of a teenage sex slave whom federal officials relocated to Hawaii and who subsequently testified to federal investigators and to Congress about the sex trade on the island. And of course, Jack had no idea when he put together stage factory inspection tours for U.S. Congress delegations, for U.S. human rights groups, and for the media. And of course, Jack's right-hand man, a 20-year friend, a business partner, Grover Norquist, had absolutely no idea, zero, nothing, zero, that any of this was going on in the Marianas. So how much did Jack's lobbying firm charge the Marianas for the privilege of operating a U.S. approved, made in the USA Chinese sweatshop? Well, it was just a mere $6.7 million to make sure that Jack and Grover stayed focused on the money of the Marianas and not on the morality of the Marianas. I got a question for, uh, for all of you out there in America, and particularly for you university students that are about to graduate in June and move on to uh, jobs in the IT field. Uh, listen to this statement. Tell me if it's true or false. Immigration is America's number one economic asset. High tech companies recognize that immigration is America's number one economic asset. Immigration is America's number one economic asset asset. I'm going to say it again a little differently. Immigration is the number one economic asset for the United States of America. Forget about everything else that we do in America. We forget about the fact that we can feed the whole world, but immigration is the number one economic asset for the United States of America. True or false? Don't even answer that stupid question. That is what the focus of our Wizard of K Street series our focus, Grover Norquist, that statements he made to Newsmax and other news organizations. He truly believes, I don't know if he really believes it, but he presents himself as believing it. You never know what Grover's doing when he's making statements, whether it's something he believes or he's scamming for his lobbying uh, bank account. That's why we're here with this micro series to unravel some of this. For you IT people graduating, do you realize 66% of available IT jobs are filled by guest workers from typically third world countries, many of which are Islamic countries that don't even care anything about the United States. The money goes back. Grover lobbying aggressively right now on Capitol Hill, even with a gang of eight, in 2014, wants to increase the number of available H-1B visas, that special visa that brings in guest workers he wants to raise the number of visas to 110%, according to a PBS study, 110% of available IT jobs. Have fun, university students, trying to go out and compete against somebody who'll take the job for half of what it should go for and half of what you would take it for. Well, our job is to unravel some of this, uh, this scam being taken place, taking place in the United States by Grover Norquist, led by him, the Wizard of K Street. He learned these tactics and techniques back in the 90s when he was um, involved with Jack Abramhoff in, in, in circumventing 
the immigration and labor laws of the United States on the Commonwealth of the Mariana Islands and assisting Chinese and Filipino business owners to run slave sweatshops, making garments that said made in America thousands and thousands of miles away. He perfected these techniques and he sees now if he brings this guest worker program to big companies that can write big lobbying checks like Microsoft, and they have a huge percentage of their IT division is through guest worker uh, individuals employed through that visa program. Uh, Grover has seen that he can make a ton of money and change the immigration laws as they are before us. Look at this, uh, this, this web that has been woven by this wizard, few bits of information, and in subsequent episodes, we will unravel this for you and show you the danger of Grover Norquist and his current immigration policies for the United States of America. He's not the super conservative you think he is, folks. He is an ideological enemy of the state. Bit of information number one. Microsoft wants to increase the H-1B visa program so they can get more and more guest workers. Microsoft. Bill Gates started Microsoft. A bit of information number two. In Seattle, there's a law firm, a lobby firm, with the name Preston Gates. The co-founder of that firm was Bill Gates. Not Bill Gates of, of Microsoft, but his father, Bill Gates Sr. Bit of information number three. Jack Abramhoff, who hired Grover to do the lobby scam in the Marianas in the 90s, was working for Preston Gates out of Seattle. So we got the Gates family, the Abramhoff family, Jack, by the way, is out of all of this, and the Grover Norquest group in there. Right now, Grover Norquest has his, his right-hand man, his, his Muslim Brotherhood protege, Suhail Khan, who reports back to him regularly, uh, working for, guess what, big tech company? You're right, Microsoft. Suhail Khan, whose family helped start the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States of America, works as in the public relations department lobbying for Microsoft. What a web woven by the wizard. What does all of this mean? Stay tuned, we'll get into it in subsequent episodes, but right now, go to this website, study Grover Norquist and his nefarious activity. The website is grovermustgo.org, grovermustgo.org. Hi, Tom Trento here with episode five of The Wizard of K Street. This is our investigative micro series where we produce each week a short video exposing Grover Norquist, not as the super conservative he presents himself to be, but indeed as an ideological enemy of the state. And today we want you to listen to Grover in his own words. This was an interview taken out of World, taken by World Net Daily, where Grover Norquist lays out his views on immigration reform. Now, hang on folks, it's just a minute or two long, but you're gonna hear more non sequiturs, more logical fallacies, more outright lies in that short amount of time, but said so convincingly. It's like, wow, he speaks convincingly, but the content of what he's saying is so fallacious. He's arguing effectively for, um, for uncontrolled immigration, particularly as it relates to the H-1B visa program that lets in guest workers, lets them in into our country for high-tech jobs where they already control 66% of the jobs. So listen carefully to what he says, and then I'll have some concluding thoughts after you analyze Grover Norquist on immigration reform. My guest at this time is Grover Norquist, president of Americans for Tax Reform. We want to get his thoughts as Congress is now just a few weeks away from returning from summer recess and most likely once again taking up immigration reform legislation. For the most part, we're now waiting on the House side to see what, if anything, they end up passing and if that will end up being reconciled with the Senate bill, which passed earlier this year. Mr. Norquist's organization is in favor of comprehensive immigration reform legislation. And, sir, thanks so much for being with us. Glad to be with you. Uh, for Just to set the stage for our listeners, 
What do you want to see in the bill? How satisfied are you with the Senate bill? And uh, if you were to make any changes to it, what would they be? Uh, we need to have an immigration policy that allows us to bring a lot more talent to the United States than, than the present one. The so-called H-1B visas or uh, visas for people with high skills um, should be dramatically increased. Why not let people stay here uh, and work if they'd like to? Uh, and that includes uh, people who want to come in and uh, work in, in the farm industry. Uh, we have a shortage of people willing to work in, uh, in farming. Uh, we have crops rotting in the fields in those states where they uh, decided they didn't like immigrants coming in and working in farms. Should we be pro-immigrant? You know, should McDonald's make hamburgers? Yes. Did Grover just say crops are rotting in the fields? See, folks, that's, this is why we're doing this investigative series, The Wizard of K Street, to expose some of his tactics and, and uh, ways in which he operates. He will find some extreme anecdotal situation that happened on the dark side of the moon, extrapolate from there that it's the greatest problem plaguing America, and he's got to come running super lobbyists and increase guest workers in America and solve all of these problems on the high end of high tech and the low end of, uh, of uh, agro work. Don't buy it, folks. Sadly, though, his, uh, his influence is so strong and his 30-year record so powerful that many, many good politicians on both sides of the aisle are falling for this nonsense. And those who are getting hurt are the American workers. So our series, The Wizard of K Street, is designed to reveal what he's doing, Grover. He's not the super conservative you think he is. He's, in fact, an ideological enemy of the state. His desire is to turn America into a Mariana paradise, no regulations, no borders, sort of very libertarian, and now a real part of the global community. Well, you got to go to Grover Must Go. Go to the website grovermustgo.org. Read all the evidence as to why those who are close to Grover, those who work closely with him, those who associate with him, ought to take a step back, ostracize him. He is not the conservative you think he is, folks. Tom Trento signing off. See you next Tom week. Tom Trento with Episode 7, The Wizard of K Street. Thanks, folks, for watching our series. And uh, thanks for all the questions and emails you're sending in, like questions like, hey, is Grover Norquest a Muslim? Hey, does he work for the Taliban? Hey, he married a, a Muslim woman. What the heck is going on? Well, folks, that's why we're doing this series, so that we can deal with analytical, actionable, factual information regarding Grover Norquest. For the first six episodes, we dealt with the more traditional elements of political activity in Washington, D.C., where he got involved with uh, scamming uh, Indians in their casinos and scamming um, uh, Americans with uh, garments made offshore. Well, now we're making a segue to Grover Norquist and his relationship to Islam. His relationship is nefarious, his very bad relationship to the Muslim Brotherhood. And um, what we have here is a two-part video right now. I'm going to do a little introduction to a 30-minute briefing that was put together by the Center for Security Policy and presented by Frank Gaffney. If you are serious about knowing about Grover Norquist and his influence in the Conservative Party, his influence with Republicans, and his influence with American patriots, you must watch the 30-minute briefing that follows my little introduction right now. Critically important. It is a bonanza of intelligence that can help you understand why we need to delegitimize Grover Norquist and the grasp he has on politicians, not only around the United States, but in several significant states. And what you're going to see in this 30-minute briefing is Grover's relationship to Muslim terrorists. And I don't use that term lightly. I mean, Muslims who have been convicted as terrorists. And in fact, one of those individuals is a, is a man by the name of Sami Al Arian. He actually pleaded guilty to terrorism charges. Former professor at University of South Florida in Tampa, got involved a little bit with the Islamic Jihad, Islamic Palestinian Jihad, uh, but worked very closely with Grover Norquist to help organize for President Bush the state of Florida Muslim community to, as they say, deliver the win to President Bush in 2000 
as a result of mobilizing Muslims. You're going to see that detailed in this briefing. You're also going to see Grover with a very interesting character by the name of Abdul Rahman Alamudi. Remember that name, Alamudi. In fact, I want to show you a little piece of video where Mr. Alamudi is doing sort of an interfaith gathering right across from the White House, October 2000, while Bill Clinton was still president. Take a look at Abdul Rahman Alamudi. Let's roll that tape. Anybody is a supporter of Hamas here? Yeah. Anybody is a supporter of Hamas here? Yeah. Hear that, Bill Clinton. We are all supporters of Hamas. Allahu Akbar. I wish they added that I'm also a supporter of Hezbollah. Anybody supports Hezbollah here? Yeah. Anybody supports Hezbollah here? Yeah. Anybody here for Hamas? Anybody here for Hezbollah? Hey folks, this is a collaborator, a confidant, a partner of Grover Norquest. But interestingly enough, he also, Abdul Rahman al Moody, during the Clinton administration, was appointed by President Clinton as his chief advisor to the Muslim community in the United States of America. And it gets crazier than that. President Bush also appointed Alamudi to be a special liaison advisor to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the Middle East. And it gets crazier than that. Alamudi was also in charge of selecting chaplains for the U.S. military and the U.S. federal prison system. The United States military is recruiting a new batch of Muslim chaplains. Only problem, we're recruiting them from a group with ties to terror. There's a man named Abdurrahman Alamudi. He is now in prison on terrorism-related charges, and he says that he was a secret member of the American branch of the Muslim Brotherhood from the beginning. This is amazing. And you know what? I want you to listen to one piece of that tape again. Roll that tape again is a man named Abdurrahman Alamudi. He is now in prison on terrorism-related charges, and he says that he was a secret member of the American branch of the Muslim Brotherhood from the beginning. Unbelievable, folks. And, and the question that plagues everybody of good conscience is, how does a guy like Abdurrahman Alamudi get so close to a president, to President Clinton, and then later on, uh, more deviously, so very, very close to President Bush, that he even was there as part of the uh, memorial service after 9-11. This guy was part of that. How does that happen? It's a fascinating, detailed intelligence explanation, uh, exposure that Frank Gaffney does in the briefing that follows immediately after I finish. Take a look at that briefing. Critically important, particularly if you're serious about understanding Grover Norquist's role with the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States of America. Alamudi was also very good friends with this outstanding human being, Muammar Gaddafi. In fact, Muammar gave his good buddy, Abdul Rahman, about 500 large to whack this outstanding human being, Crown Prince Abdul of Saudi Arabia. But before Alamudi was caught, before the blood started to flow, before the blood started to flow, what are we talking about here? This is Grover Norquest's business partner, they worked together to start the uh, Islamic Free Market Institute. Before the blood started to flow, Alamudi got busted, got pinched. And now he's spending 23 long years in federal prison where he belongs. But the U.S. government cut six of that. So he's only doing about 17 years. He did 10. He's got about seven years left. Our sources tell us the guy is singing like crazy. Beware Muslim Brotherhood folks out there. Your main guy is singing. You're gonna get all the details of much of this in Frank Gaffney's exposition right after I finish. You're also gonna see in that exposition individuals like Khalid Safouri, who Alamudi appointed to run Grover's organization, the Islamic Free Market Institute, which was supposed to bring Islamic money into the United States. You're also gonna see, you can't make this up, folks. You're gonna see our Frank Casino Jack, Jack Abramoff, getting involved with the Jew-hating president of Malaysia, Mattathir Mohammed, and of course, Rover dives into that little operation. Hey, look, uh, Gaffney and the folks over at CSP did a fascinating investigative expose. 
and one segment after another does the deep dive, you will get a phenomenal understanding of the internal influence operations of the Muslim Brotherhood and how Grover Norquest has been at the forefront of that with all these terrorists who have wound up in jail or many who are still operating, like David Safavian, Jamal Al-Barzanjini, Musamil Siddiqui, guy I dealt with out in California, Suhail Khan, guy we dealt with here in the United States, Samuel Arian's brother, his brother-in-law, Mazin Al-Najari. If you really want to see the level of influence that Grover Norquist has in the Republican Party, in the Patriot Movement, and the Conservative Movement in the United States, please watch this 30 minute plus briefing following very shortly. You can click on uh, the email to watch it or just watch it as I finish here. And let me tell you, let me sum this up. Here in Florida and many other states, Grover has spent 30 years plus putting his tentacles into the congressional members and into the administration in various states. It's, it is essential for true conservatives to break that grasp. Cut those tentacles loose that Grover has. Do a reverse influence operation on him by presenting factual information, analytical information, fact-based, indisputable. And we challenge anybody out there to take a look at Gaffney's presentation and evaluate the factual nature of the information being presented. You will conclude like us that Grover Norquist is not the conservative he makes himself out to be. He is indeed an enemy of the state and someone who needs to be disrupted his operation, disrupted, destroyed, or disabled before November 4th, 2014. Thanks. Tom Trent, I'll see you next week. Let's take a closer look at one of the Ikwan's most successful influence operations, its penetration and manipulation of the Republican Party. Back in 1998, three prominent GOP and conservative operatives reportedly saw, for various reasons, a need to establish close ties with Muslim Americans. Lobbyist Jack Abramoff, tax reform advocate Grover Norquist, and political strategist Karl Rove. This was not their first collaboration. The three had been close colleagues since they first served together in the leadership of college Republicans. According to an account provided by Abramoff, one reason for such an outreach was that Muslim Americans appeared to be a promising new constituency for the Republican Party and its leading candidate for the GOP nomination, then Texas Governor George W. Bush, for whom Karl Rove worked as chief campaign strategist. This constituency was seen as potentially capable of being for the Republicans what Jews have long been for the Democratic Party, a well-heeled, generous, and reliable voting bloc. Other considerations also evidently made an effort to include Muslims in the conservative Republican coalition appear attractive to at least two of these GOP operatives. As we shall see, among such considerations apparently were business opportunities for Jack Abramoff and revenue streams for Grover Norquist. In 1998, Alamudi joined forces with Grover Norquist to found the Islamic Free Market Institute, better known as the Islamic Institute, or II. Checks in the public domain indicate that in 1999, Abdurrahman Alamudi gave or lent the Islamic Institute at least $20,000 in seed money from his own personal account. It's unclear whether he provided additional funds to the Institute, and if so, how much. These funds alone, however, represented almost 12% of the contributions received by the organization in that year, according to an Institute 990 filing with the IRS. In addition, Alamudi ensured his control of the Institute as a vehicle for penetrating and running influence operations against the conservative movement by installing his right-hand man, Khalid Safuri, as its first executive director. Safuri was also given the title of President of the Islamic Free Market Institute Foundation. In the 1990s, Safuri, who's originally of Palestinian extraction, worked as Director for Government Affairs and Executive Director of the American Muslim Council, the highly effective Muslim Brotherhood front group and influence operation that Alamudi personally founded and ran. Safuri also collaborated with Alamudi in the American Task Force for Bosnia, an organization that sought to aid the Muslim population there after Yugoslavia's violent breakup. At the time, this cause happened to be a top agenda item and recruiting vehicle for international jihadists around the world. In his spare time, Safuri reportedly helped Jewish lobbyist Jack Abramoff secure clients for his lobbying operations, including Mahathir Mohamed, the virulent anti-Semite who was then Prime Minister of Malaysia. 
The hope, evidently, was that this representational arrangement would translate, in short order, into Safuri brokered entree to gutter and other wealthy Muslim oil states in the Middle East as well. Jack Abramoff was not the only one who sought to benefit financially from the GOP Muslim outreach initiative. Apparently, Grover Norquist was also able to cash in on his relationship with Alamudi together with David Safavian, his then partner in a lobbying firm they founded in 1997, Janus Merritt Strategies. According to lobbying registration forms filed by Janus Merritt, the company represented Abdurrahman Alamudi during the 2000-2001 period. After Safavian joined the Bush administration, Janice Merritt's registration forms were changed to declare that instead of Alamudi, the firm represented Jamal Albarzinji. There's a certain out of the frying pan into the fire quality to this action since Barzinji is at least as pedigreed an Ikwan civilization jihadist as is Alamudi. After all, Barzinji was president of the Muslim Students Association, the original Muslim Brotherhood front organization in the United States, and has been involved with or funded a number of others over the years. For example, he is one of the founders of the North American Islamic Trust, NATE, a past leader of the Islamic Society of North America, vice president of the International Institute of Islamic Thought, and a major contributor to the radical Sharia adherent Dar al-Hidra Mosque al-Awaki, formerly led in Falls Church, Virginia. The obvious question is, in light of what was easily ascertainable about the Muslim Brotherhood ties and jihadist sympathies and associations of the so-called community leaders with whom Jack Abramoff, Grover Norquist, and Karl Rove were working, what did these prominent Republicans know, and when did they know it? Certainly, by the beginning of the Bush 43 administration, there could be no plausible deniability about Alamudi's true nature for anyone associated with the Islamic Institute. After all, in October 2000, he'd made known his support for Hamas and Hezbollah at the rally in Lafayette Square, an event that was, by the way, sponsored by the Islamic Free Market Institute, among other Muslim Brotherhood-affiliated groups. For that matter, in 1998, Alamudi had said, quote, If we are outside this country, we can say, O oh Allah! destroy America, unquote. Then, early in 2001, Alamudi participated with some 400 other top jihadists in an international terrorists strategy session in Beirut. As Fox News reported, this meeting brought together, quote, the world's most extreme Islamic terror groups to set aside their differences and unite for jihad, holy war, against Israel and the United States, unquote. Despite such jihadist connections, or more likely, because of them, the Alamudi Safuri team generated significant sums to support the Muslim Brotherhood's conservative influence operation. According to the Islamic Free Market Institute Foundation's 990 reports to the Internal Revenue Service, the organization had revenues of over $2.7 million between 1998 and 2006, the last year for which such reports are available. A principal source of such revenues appears to have been a series of conferences the Islamic Institute sponsored starting in 2002. The first was an international Islamic finance conference held in Washington, D.C. in September of that year. Its purpose was advertised as bringing the financial world together. The sponsoring organization, the General Council for Islamic Banks and Financial Institutions, must have greatly appreciated the value of a conservative-affiliated Muslim organization, introducing it to an official Washington that was, at the time, fully in Republican hands. In fact, this conference amounted to a prime example of civilization jihad, combining an effective influence operation with what is, as we have seen, a leading edge of the stealth jihadist campaign in the West, Sharia-compliant finance. The Islamic bankers paid handsomely for the Institute's help. According to its 990 filing for 2002, a conference that year generated $48,000 for the Islamic Free Market Institute Foundation. That represented approximately 10% of the organization's declared revenue for that year. This event evidently also paid dividends insofar as it impressed new sponsors. In each of the three subsequent years, the Islamic Free Market Institute Foundation declared that it had spent between $170,000 and $263,000 on international conferences dealing with, quote, democracy and free markets, unquote. Even more important than the fundraising capabilities of this influence operation were the host of benefits the Islamists immediately enjoyed, thanks to their association with Grover Norquist, and the Islamic Institute's co-location with his organization, Americans for Tax Reform. By recruiting a man best known for his No New Taxes pledge 
to serve as what Soviet influence Operation Tradecraft called an agent of influence. The Brotherhood's Alamudi Safuri team instantly secured a degree of conservative political coloration and legitimacy that it might otherwise have taken years to cultivate, if it could have been achieved at all. Grover Norquist's relationships with Republican, conservative, and libertarian politicians and the cohort of think tanks, political action committees, lobbying organizations, and other groups that support or try to influence them afforded Alamudi's team extraordinary opportunities to engage in their own influence operations of the civilization jihadist kind. The centerpiece of Grover Norquist's networking activities is what some have described as the Grand Central Station of the conservative movement, a meeting that Norquist convenes each Wednesday morning in Washington of what he calls the center-right coalition. During my time in the Wednesday meetings, I witnessed Grover Norquist routinely giving prominent positions at the center-right coalition's table and on his weekly agenda to Khalid Safuri, other Islamic Institute personnel, and their friends. I happen to have seen such mainstreaming firsthand. In fact, my own organization, the Center for Security Policy, sublet space from Americans for tax reform. That's right, for seven long years. We shared elevators, a hallway, lavatories, a conference space, and even a Xerox room. I consider this unlikely arrangement to have been really an act of providence. Had I not been given such a vantage point, including for several years, regular participation in Norquist's Wednesday meetings, I would have been far less equipped to provide this course. As it happened, shortly after we moved into our offices, one of my colleagues pulled me aside and asked, do you know there's an Islamist front group on the other side of that Xerox room? I didn't at the time, but from then until now, I have been trying to make sure privately at first and publicly since early in 2003, that conservatives and other Americans are aware of the help Grover Norquist has given and is giving to the Muslim Brotherhood and others promoting the Sharia agenda in America. Let's examine in detail the nature and the implications of that help. It's bad enough that he was by so doing compromising what the military calls the operational security of political and other strategies discussed at those meetings. Norquist was also thereby credentialing Muslim Brotherhood operatives, and thus presenting to the Wednesday meeting and others individuals who would otherwise never be mistaken for conservative Republicans. Particularly worrying was the extent to which this credentialing translated into access for such individuals, first to George W. Bush's 2000 campaign for the presidency, then after Mr. Bush's election, to his administration. Let's explore six examples of the Norquist-enabled Muslim Brotherhood effort to penetrate and influence the Bush 43 team, in the process giving rise to precedents and openings for Brotherhood civilization jihad operations that continue at an intensified level today. We've already been introduced to Abdurrahman al Moody, the top Muslim brother who, after years of close collaboration with the Clinton-Gore administration and the Democratic Party, set up the Islamic Free Market Institute to gain access for his team to the GOP. As a result, he was one of a group of prominent Islamists who were invited to meet then-candidate Bush at the governor's mansion in Austin in May 2000. We've also met Khalid Safuri, who moved from being Alamudi's right-hand man at the American Muslim Council to being his trusted executive director at the Islamic Free Market Institute. Norquist arranged for Safuri to become the coordinator for the Bush 2000 campaign's Muslim outreach. Not surprisingly, the Muslims the Bush team subsequently reached out to were, with few if any exceptions, Islamists like Alamudi, with whom Safuri is shown here at the governor's mansion in Austin. Another prominent American Islamist is Niyad Awad. Back in October 1993, Awad was a leader of the Islamic Association for Palestine. Recall that the IAP was one of the groups listed on the attachment to the Brotherhood's explanatory memorandum we discussed in part two of this course. On October 3, 1993, Niyad Awad joined other Muslim Brotherhood operatives to found a new organization, the Council on American Islamic Relations, better known as CARE. The meeting was wiretapped by the FBI because it was a gathering of the Palestine Committee in the United States, 
The Palestine Committee had been established by the American Ikhwan after the adoption of a resolution by the International Muslim Brotherhood aimed at gaining, quote, media, money, and men for the Palestinian cause, unquote. Documents in the government's possession reveal that by Palestinian cause, the Brotherhood meant the Islamic Resistance Movement, or Hamas. Transcripts of this 1993 meeting were introduced into evidence in the Holy Land Foundation trial. Awad continues to serve as CARE's executive director. Despite Niyad Awad's long and known record of involvement with Hamas and other Muslim Brotherhood operations, he was one of the Muslim community leaders the Alamudi Norquist Safuri team arranged to have President Bush reach out to after 9-11. Here he's shown next to Mr. Bush in a photo op of the president admiring the Saudi-financed Islamic Center of Washington. Khalid Safuri and other Islamists were also featured prominently with Mr. Bush. Thanks to Niyad Awad's leadership in the civilization jihad, Kerr earned the dubious distinction of being listed by federal prosecutors as an unindicted co-conspirator in the Holy Land Foundation trial. Kerr was also listed as one of the members of the Muslim Brotherhood's Palestine Committee. In other words, the government has formally declared in court that CARE is Hamas. On the basis of the evidence provided in that case, no fewer than four federal judges, one at the trial level, three at the appellate level, upheld the validity of that designation. When the presiding jurist in the 2008 proceeding, District Judge Jorge Solis, rejected a request by Kerr and two other unindicted co-conspirators to have that designation expunged, his ruling said, in part, quote, the government has produced ample evidence to establish the associations of Kerr, Isna, and Nate with the Holy Land Foundation, the Islamic Association of Palestine, and with Hamas, unquote. We've also met Samuel Arian. As was discussed earlier in this course, Al Aryan was the Muslim activist who founded the red-green popular front group known as the National Coalition to Protect Political Freedom. It's now been renamed the Defending Dissent Foundation. At the time, Al Aryan's ostensible day job was that of a professor of computer sciences at the University of South Florida. It turned out that Samuel Arian had another job. He used his position at the university as a cover for his role as one of the top figures in the Islamist terrorist group Palestinian Islamic Jihad. PIJ, as it's known, is believed to have been responsible for at least a hundred deaths in the Middle East. Is there any question that Samuel Arian was deeply involved in Palestinian Islamic Jihad? Long before Samuel Arian's February 2003 arrest and 2005 trial on terrorism charges, his Islamist friends and their allies on the radical left decried criticism of him as racism and bigotry. Even after Alarian pled guilty to one count of supporting a terrorist organization, many of them have continued to insist that he is an innocent man, a prisoner of conscience who was falsely accused and wrongly prosecuted for his unpopular views on the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Senior U.S. District Judge James Moody, however, who presided in Alarian's trial, was under no such illusions, however. The judge chastised Al Aryan in 2006, saying, quote, You looked your neighbors in the eyes and said you had nothing to do with Palestinian Islamic Jihad. This trial exposed that as a lie. Your backup claim is that your efforts were only to provide charities for widows and orphans. That, too, is a lie. The evidence was clear in this case that you were a leader of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. You were on the board of directors and an officer, the secretary. Directors control the actions of an organization, even the PIJ. And you were an active leader. Unquote. Alarian would not be arrested for his involvement with Palestinian Islamic Jihad until nearly three years after this picture was taken of him with his family, and then candidate George W. Bush at a campaign stop in Florida. Federal authorities certainly knew of Alarian's role in the terrorist group well before March 2000, though. In the course of his trial, the government produced wiretaps dating back to 1994, in which Alarian argued with other PIJ leaders about the future direction of the organization. So how did an Islamist running an international terrorist organization get this close to a future president of the United States? Presumably, most of Mr. Bush's political team was ignorant of Alarian's PIJ connection and was persuaded that such a meeting was in order simply to demonstrate the importance the candidate attached to the Muslim community and thus to cement its support for his campaign. 
Given their own Islamist sympathies and agendas, however, it is inconceivable that Abdurrahman al Amudi and Khalid Safuri and probably others at the Islamic Institute were similarly clueless about those of Sami al Aryan. To reinforce the notion that al Aryan's ground game had been decisive for Mr. Bush, Grover Norquist went so far as to write in the American Spectator immediately after the election that, quote, George W. Bush was elected President of the United States of America because of the Muslim vote, unquote, in Florida. In other words, Norquist wanted the new administration to remember that Sammy Alarian and his team delivered for the Texas governor. As one wit caustically observed in response, given the closeness of that hanging Chad fraught election, red-haired Ugandans could have claimed they decided the Florida election. Still, Norquist's pushing that line could only have helped reinforce his Islamist cadre's claims on positive treatment in the new Bush 43 administration. In fact, two such claims were presumably exactly what the Bush campaign's Muslim outreach coordinator, Khalid Safuri, and his Islamist friends had in mind in arranging this photo op. The first was the reasonable expectation that such tangible proof of Al Arian's access to George W. Bush could come in handy in the event law enforcement tried to prosecute the professor over his secret Palestinian Islamic Jihad operation. The second imperative was Al Arian's passionate determination to block the use of what he called secret evidence. What is secret evidence? Well, this is a pejorative term Islamists like Al Arian and their friends on the radical left apply to classified information withheld from non-American defendants in federal judicial proceedings. This practice was authorized by the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act enacted in 1996 during the Clinton presidency. The law was adopted to protect against the needless compromise of intelligence or the means by which it was obtained. Obviously, such an authority frustrated foreign enemies in the United States by facilitating their prosecution and reducing the downside risks entailed in doing so. In the late 1990s and early years of the new century, Al Arian was utterly obsessed with blocking secret evidence. That should not have been a surprise. After all, he had an intense self-interest in securing such a prohibition. At the time of the Alarian's Plant City meeting with George W. Bush, Mazen al-Najjar, Sami's brother-in-law and his co-conspirator in Palestinian Islamic Jihad, was being held without bail, in part on the basis of such evidence. Al Aryan had to worry that if secret evidence were able to be used successfully in Al Najjar's case, the chances would greatly increase that Sami, who also was not a U.S. citizen, would almost certainly face prosecution and deportation as well. July 2001 brought a revealing insight into Grover Norquist's value to Sami Al Aryan and his team in connection with their campaign against secret evidence. The occasion was an event hosted by the National Coalition to Protect Political Freedom, the red-green popular front Al Arian established primarily to lobby against secret evidence, or, as David Horowitz's front page magazine would say, to lobby for terror. Norquist received an award for being, quote, a champion of the abolishment movement against secret evidence. When subsequently challenged on the company he was keeping and this award, Norquist insisted that he was proud of the recognition. Yet another preeminent figure in the Muslim Brotherhood's American operations is Muzamil Siddiqui. For three years, Siddiqui served as president of the largest Muslim Brotherhood front, the Islamic Society of North America. He's also chaired the North American Islamic Trust, a Saudi underwritten vehicle for financing the mortgages of mosques and thereby ensuring Islamist control of their services, schools, events, etc. He is currently the director of the Islamic Society of Orange County and chairman of the Executive Council of the Influential Brotherhood Jurisprudential Front known as the Feek Council of North America. In 1996, Siddiqui explicitly announced his commitment to bringing Sharia to all lands, including the United States. Muzamil Siddiqui issued an ominous warning at the same October 2000 anti-Israel demonstration in Lafayette Square that was co-sponsored by Norquist's Islamic Free Market Institute and used by Abdurrahman al as a platform from which to declare his support for Hamas and Hezbollah. Siddiqui announced, quote, America has to learn that if you remain on the side of injustice, the wrath of God will come. Despite Siddiqui's record and associations, 
Thanks to the Islamic Institute team's access to the White House, he, of all Muslims in America, was chosen to represent Islam in the ecumenical memorial service held at the National Cathedral in Washington on September 14, 2001. Siddiqui was also subsequently given an audience with President Bush at the White House. He used the occasion to present a Quran to Mr. Bush. President Bush responded in a way that demonstrated his unfamiliarity with the totality of the book he had just been given, let alone the larger body of Sharia doctrine. He pronounced that, quote, the teachings of Islam are the teachings of peace and good, unquote. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. And now you know why Glenn Beck said about Karl Rove and Grover Norquist this. You guys have the spine of a worm, the ethics of whores, and the integrity of pirates, with my apologies to worms, whores, and pirates. Well said, Glenn. See you all tomorrow on the Tom Trento Show. This is J. Mark Campbell signing off.